IT risk identification. Can we spend a minute? Like, can anyone touch on what does that mean? What does basically risk identification means, and why do we even have it in the first chapter? Seriously, why? Anyone? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, so this is John Holmblad. I mean, before you can respond to risk, you have to know what the risks are. It's kind of a basic thing, right? Okay, so I, I definitely agree. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say, that's, that's why this is kind of the-, the And I absolutely, step. absolutely agree. Um, but at the same time, uh, does anybody want to add a little bit without really using the word risk or the identification? I know we touched a little bit high level on what truly is risk in the first part of the class, right? And uh, just looking for a really low, low, low level kind of explanation if anybody has any pointers on that. So, you, so cybersecurity is just managing and mitigating risk, right? Ah, I don't like that, Stephanie. Did you just minimize cybersecurity to just manage it? She said, it's just managing <laughs> risk now. It's just it's managing value. And mitigating risk. I disagree with that. <laughs> it is adding value. It's making more money. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> So, so, well, that's what I think it is. Maybe it's more than that. But with the risk management framework and the authorization process, that's what we're doing, right? Okay. We're trying so, to discover like the risk appetite, which risks are acceptable, mm -hmm. right? So that we can get approval to operate these systems. Okay. Um, All right. All right. Go ahead. Next. If I if I could just add something, Dr. Waziri, Jacob here. Mm -hmm. uh, just adding to what was just said, I think uh, this this probably very difficult for us to eliminate all the risks. So we probably want to identify them all and then be able to weigh them against the consequences or the the damage that may result from them, and then prioritize them with by aligning our resources against them. Again, I absolutely agree with all of those things you both mentioned from obviously you can't even know what to mitigate without really identifying and even assessing it, right? Which is all part of those things that we're going to talk about. And um, as Stephanie also mentioned, um, go getting those approval and whatsoever, but I still would like to think it's all beyond that. Uh, Are you mentioning, it, Doctor, as of like yeah. the main business objective is like what's affecting our business, what needs to be accomplished in order to make uh, things happen and make the stakeholders happy and... You Thank know, you very much. I actually absolutely treat this question very big to just pick on everybody to see if we have started thinking of it more from that business objective as well as that adding value perspective, right? Not just we are doing it for the sake of somebody said it. Or we are just doing it just to feel safe. No, I was definitely looking for that part of, we are actually identifying problems because when we close them, it adds value, right? That value, business objectives, all of those nice MBA words that we tend to throw around. <laughs> I absolutely, absolutely agree with that. But yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And there is a reason why I, tr I throw, um, I treat this question as well as it's very vague, the way I put it. It's truthfully how it is. When it comes to that, making sure you are manager risk, but from a business perspective, you find yourself constantly trying to see or rationalize what I am doing right now. How does it contribute to the business objectives? How does it add value? How does it ensure profit and uh, all of those things. And I can tell you one, uh, for some of us that were system admins, um, for the longest time, we have always been put behind the scenes. Sometimes our little spaces are even in the basement because everybody thinks like we are just a money pit. We don't generate anything, right? And uh, today there is that kind of culture within organizations where you find the IT shop is considered like, okay, yeah, you guys are just there to maintain. Whereas um, even if it's in the tech industry, you find, okay, software developers, people that are building the product uh, considered the most valuable asset, not based on, okay, everybody as a person is very valuable, but they are the generating 
uh, roles, whereas the IT shop is kind of considered like, okay, these just many things. And on our products, risk professional, if we truly want to get through those executives, the board, senior management, get those budget that you need to actually ensure things are running smoothly, there will always, always be a need for us to translate our actions into those business objectives. Please again for, I'm going to crack a joke here. Don't take it personal. But for those of you that have your profile in suits, if you disagree with me, like, nah, you don't need to do that. You just give me a hundred million dollars of the project for the cybersecurity sector. Please let me know otherwise. I'm looking at you, Jody and Norris, because you guys are the only ones in suits. So executives. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Is there yeah, so, so if I could, I, I would say I, I understand why you were so vague in your question because I think a risk identification is a, a function of the mission goals and strategy, right? The uh, design and architecture. So it kind of goes to the beginning of the uh, chapter that talks about the capacity, uh, appetite, and tolerance, right? And how you how you really look at it from the enterprise level. At least that's how I kind of engage it in in my position over. And I want to person agree with you. That's absolutely correct. Because think of it as you are the risk professional. Today, you are the CISO for your organization. And now you have to go in front of the CEO or the president. And you, got, you have to tell them, like, what you are doing really adds value. But now you're talking to a CISO who, sorry, a CEO who basically runs a cupcake business. And you have that and the, yeah, we need this risk identification just so we can get this. And I mean, they will never understand that. You just have to talk to them from that value perspective. So yeah, same thing. I agree with you. And that's, again, one of the reasons why I kind of treat it really vague. Because one of the challenging things that I found in my little time within the cybersecurity management aspect of things that really differs with the technical side is truly, truly the ambiguity in the risk management area you find, yeah, there are steps. Like, okay, do this before this, do this before this. But as you can begin to put those into practice, you'll find that things just come up from different sides, like seriously. Like even the ATO, for those of you that are coming from the government sector, um, you know how it is. Like <laughs> you finish thinking like, yeah, I've built my SSP package, all those ICMPs, whatsoever, all of those fancy documents, they are already only for you to realize like, oh crap, now we gotta move back to all the way to step one and change the categorization system just because right now we can't, we don't even have a SCIF or we don't have this in place. As such, we have to maybe dumb down the categorization from moderate to low. Like all of those things, they just come at you from different angles and it's truly, truly, for lack of a better word, it's just a vicious cycle where you, you find it very hard to get out. So I always say this, one of your, um, one of the things with risk management, it's from a personal, and please just take this as it is, uh, it's not part of the class, but I always say that for me, one of the early things that I realized with getting into this risk management, all of these ATO compliance kind of things is truly the ability to embrace ambiguities, like, and basically just be ready to put your head into the fire, because <laughs> that's how I say it, for sure. Um, okay, so for today, we are going to talk about risk identification. And at a very high level, just think of it, whether we take Stephanie's approach, of seeing cybersecurity as a problem. I didn't like that, but it's okay. We are still friends. Or we take it on our approach of adding value, you know? Either way, there will always be a need to identify what problems might arise, right? Um, if you take it from the side of, uh, let's just identify the problem so we treat them and make sure they don't impact us still the same thing or if you see it more as let's see what problems might arise and uh, make sure we take care of them so we save some money right now before later or we don't end up having all of these compliance as well as regulatory or sometimes even legal issues then either way it's 
truly part of that identifying what the problems or what value addition you can um, you will eventually encounter so after we talk about risk identification for the next class which is chapter two going to be risk assessment mitigation and all of those things but we will get into those when we get there okay so what's the objective of today's lectures um i think i need to work a little bit on these slides seeing that it's already out there there's no need for all of these fancy things to be coming by themselves everybody has the slide to um, read in but yeah we are going to basically again identify some risk that are related to assets um it's common outside of the risks management and the cyber security area to hear people throw all of these terminologies like threats risk impact assets whatsoever but in this class we are going to get nitty-gritty in terms of how those differ risk is not equal to threat we know that we touch on that if you don't definitely go back and <laughs> read those intros um again assets are something else right asset and value there is a clear difference between those two so i will highly highly recommend i don't know if we plugged it in there if we have not um dave please uh actually it's fine i have my notes here let me know but um there is a nice glossary by Isaka that they put together with just definition of all of these terms and they did it well such that everybody should uh, be able to understand. But if there's any word that keeps throwing you off, like how does risk differs with asset or how does risk and threat differs, feel free to shoot an email or set up some phone call and we'll clarify that. But in the interest of time, I think we're just going to move forward. Again, um, hopefully by the end of the class, you should be able to kind of understand different risk scenarios and the consequences that might happen if uh, we decide not to identify such a risk and uh, how they can also add value if we identify those things at the early stage, right? And um, hopefully by the end of today's lectures, we should be able to feel comfortable that yeah, we can now identify a problem, which is just <laughs> a small portion of it. And uh, by the end, we should be thinking of, okay, now that we have identified the problem, how do we begin to assess it if it's going to really affect us or not? Again, there will always, always be business objectives, support business objectives, value, like you keep hearing it in the class. I wasn't kidding when I said, I'm going to bore you with those, uh, terminologies and uh another tip when you're looking taking the quiz you got to wear that hat of everything you do doing you are adding value to the class you are not just doing it for the sake of um treatment is everyone seeing that chat pop up that usually come out of the slide or no this is just my screen Feel free to unmute yourself and respond to me, please. Does the chat shows? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Oh, it does? Okay, uh, let me see if I can fix my screen real quick. Because I do not like that to... Yeah, it seems like it's gonna... I think I'll figure that out during the break. I apologize. Hopefully it doesn't interrupt. Okay. Now, um... Some keywords as we begin to identify what truly risk, as we begin to look into how to identify risk, right? There are certain things we need to bring into the mix. Uh, uh, mix. One, let's look at risk capacity. Beyond the definition, can anybody add to me, like, what do you think is risk capacity? Please don't use the words that are on the slide or just use words like risk. Feel free to unmute yourself for a couple of seconds. I'm with me. Uh, Jonathan, how much how much damage are you willing to take? Okay. How much okay. money are you willing to lose? Okay. How much money are you willing to lose? Okay. Anyone? Well, I mean, and also, well, it's not just money. It's like brand reputation. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. risk can involve a lot of different things. So it's it's. Mm -hmm. You know what is your your company's risk tolerance and in a variety of areas 
you know, and also I think, you know, you're, if someone's done a business impact analysis, I mean, that can help drive some of these questions and drive the, 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 the amounts of, you know, some discussions on tolerance. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. I see risk tolerance there and I see risk capacity there. And I hear some definitions that are more aligned, like some explanations that are more aligned with risk tolerance. Sometimes even the word tolerance is used, but we are more asking of capacity, right? What is then the difference between the risk capacity and tolerance? Anyone? When I reviewed this, uh, I came to the conclusion that the risk capacity is um, what the board of the, of the enterprise thinks uh, can be lost uh, and the, the enterprise still stay in business, right? So yes. it's, it's, it's a financial quantity um, that gets determined and, and that is the overall risk capacity. That's, that's how I interpret it. Yes, um, I agree absolutely with that. I want to quickly address something. Um, Stephanie brought, I don't know if it was Stephanie, I apologize. I can't see who it is. I was just trying to pick from the vo voice. But um, I heard something about monetary and someone said it's not only the money. We will touch a little bit about quantitative and qualitative analysis and something. Well, um, we'll touch a little bit on those in the subsequent chapters, but it is always key to also identify what the asset is. And that is where you start to delineate between, oh, it's money or it's reputation, or it's actually that same recipe we were talking about in the previous. Uh, lectures. Now, coming back to risk capacity, I absolutely um, agree that um, what the organization can take before it has, there is a severe impact, right? So I tend to, <laughs> I do this bad thing where I associate definitions with my life or something like that, but I tend to think of risk capacity more like an emergency fund, right? So something has happened or something might happen or you lose a job. How much do you, how much can you actually take or as well as how much do you have that will sustain you before now, you know, uh, I apologize. I hope if you have any kid there, please let me know. So I definitely chew my words, but before she hit the fan, right? Um, that's what I tend to think about risk capacity. So an organization uh, maybe has data spills or some form of attack or maybe there is no, uh, let's do disruption. This week's topic, sorry, last week's news topic were all related to disruption. So uh, I believe Ken was touching on how schools got disrupted. Let's say Amazon or Walmart or either of them were attacked with some form of either ransomware that hijacked the servers. Well, that's a bad example because they should have other <laughs> servers run elsewhere, but um, let's say just their website is down. How long in time, now in perspective of time, how long can they truly, truly stay down before it begins to really impact them from a profit capacity, right? We take COVID, for example, this is a huge disruption. And again, one might say, oh, this is not a cyber related thing, but it is still a risk and it is all part of risk management. And we have seen Again, uh, not to be too political in here, but we have seen how a lot of people, I was reading one article where he was talking about all of these airline industries for the past decade, they have been making so much profit, but here they are now looking for all bailout funds, right? Like, is it that they have not been saving some <laughs> money aside, thinking of uh, what will happen if something like COVID happens? Now, just three months or five months in and basically everybody is thinking of okay if this is if this keeps going on we are going to be out of business by this time we don't have to discuss why we got there but the capacity to build that resilience for a certain time is also something right so when i think of risk capacity i think of it more of how much 
resilience or buffer or how much can an organization take before it really begins to see those crazy, crazy um, risks come up like, okay, we might be getting out of business. Um, risk appetite, anyone? Or does anybody have any question? By the way, I can't, I'm unable to really see the charts. So if there is uh, any specific question, feel free to unmute yourself and just call it to my attention. Risk appetite, anyone? Want to take on that? I think this could be the regulatory bounds of what you can play in. Okay. So, so if your company gets hacked and you have, you know, 50 million records, well, mm -hmm. you only have to report if you hit 75 million records, so it doesn't hit the threshold. Okay. So threshold and appetite. Mm. Okay. By the way, English is not my first language, so I tend to have challenge trying to really take out the English definition out of things. Okay, anybody? Uh, this is Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the appetite is the level where the organization wants to be. Okay. Okay. The level of where the organization wants to be. Okay, yes. anyone? Yep. This is Al. Um, I would say appetite is the willingness to go after the objective or to tolerate possible loss. Okay. Uh, the appetite to tolerate possible loss, is that what you said? Sorry, sorry, I was outside. Uh, I said uh, appetite is the willingness to go after an objective, such as ingenuity, development, and or some type of contract compared to the possibility of not attaining that contract and losing out on that possible account. I love that. Only that I kind of disagree with it a little bit, but I love it because it challenged everything I keep saying right now, because you are seeing the appetite more on that value and business goal thing, right? Where what's our appetite and how much business are we going to go after? I absolutely agree with that. And when I see it more from the risk, it's a little bit inverse of that, but yes. Um, sure. Um, does anybody remember when we were talking about that difference between, say, what a library computer, how a library computer will be configured and maybe that of DOD, something like that? Oh, no, actually, we used, um, I think, Amazon or Walmart where Walmart might decide like, you know, we are just going to configure it such that if everything happens, that website is still going to be up. Whereas DOD might configure their devices um, in the manner where, you know, if anything is to happen, lock down. We don't care, just nuke everything, <laughs> right? So that sometimes, well, not necessarily sometimes, that is what I tend to consider the appetite. But risk appetite is always, always driven based on the objectives, mission, goals of that organization, no matter what. When we look at DOD, based on the same example we just uh, highlighted now, and then we also look at um, uh, Walmart, based on the example we just highlighted, it is not like they just decided randomly, but rather the objectives, their objectives differ. DOD is in the business of national security and there are certain things that if they are out they really compromise everybody as such they rather lose everything than have it in the wrong hands whereas walmart is in the business of profit so no matter what so long as they are willing to take the hit so long as they make a profit right again even on that to the last person's point Again, I apologize, not good with names, uh, associating names to, uh, to voices. More so as such, I can't remember who spoke, but same thing with Walmart. Like they are willing to say, you know what, no matter what, we don't care if the SSL certificate has expired. We don't care if truly every single hacker can now log into any computer. Keep that website up so long as it is we asked, uh, it is still legal, make sure that website is up so people can shop and we can make profit. But their decision as well is driven based on their objectives, based on Walmart's goal, based on Walmart's mission. So when I think of appetite, 
I think of appetite based on that. And a lot of you have actually answered that as well. It is just, so the only difference is I am always looking for explanation truly at the most dumped down level because you'll be surprised how challenging it gets when you try <laughs> when you try to explain to a CEO who has no business with anything cybersecurity whatsoever, any executive, anything around these things. And then it tends to become more educational rather than them explaining like you explain at their level. All right. I think we also touch high level on risk tolerance, right? Um, why are we looking into this? Why are we talking about risk capacity, appetite, tolerance, even though we're talking about identification, risk identification? Why do we have to talk about those capacity, appetite, tolerance? Anyway? This is Rebecca, so that you know uh, what, are the th what are the things that you're gonna identify as being a risk with those capacity, appetite, and tolerance in mind to help ID those things. Absolutely. I 100% agree. And that same reason is why, uh, I think it's the next slide, we are going to talk about the risk culture and communication. I don't know if a lot of you have been following it, but anybody that has invested in Tesla, they are on the moon right now. Um, it, the stocks really went up, but you look at someone like Elon Musk, who some really see him as very, um, I, I don't even know what to use, but this is the same person who is going on Twitter and saying like, he, in his opinion, the stock valuation of his company is really, really high. So, but you look at that and still people are flocking it, right? So all of those things from culture, the communication skills, the risk capacity, appetite, tolerance, these are all nuances that when you put together, they allow you to identify the organizational risk. Um, yeah, any question on this? All right, so talking about risk culture. I have a question, doctor, yes, if you don't mind, please. This is okay. a generic thing, um, like a hint from you, sir. Uh, regarding this class, when we, from now on, like we take a class, like exams or quizzes or things like that, do we have to have that business mindset when we approach these questions and forget the technical side? Is it a combination of both? Uh, what, what's your recommendation, doctor, please? Good question. Um, I don't know if you are here in the early class, but I was saying this, put the heart of a senior management, put the heart of a CEO, if you are doing anything in this class, especially the first part of this class around the ISACA, because this class, if you are to kind of relate this class in terms of career stages, you will find <laughs> engineers have no business with this class. Uh, technical people have no business with this class. People that at the analyst level, again, not calling it different people's level, but seriously, people at the junior level have no business with this, like have nothing to do with this class yet. You find this class will be more beneficial at the higher level. So if you're taking anything from the quiz or even getting your security questions, even though there's no right or wrong to that, I will highly recommend definitely put in that leadership uh, hat. And not to deviate from the lectures, <clears throat> this might help some of you, is uh, let me throw a, an example here. The new iPhone is coming out, I think, tomorrow. Uh, an organization that is sitting in a lot of money might decide like, you know what? Uh, someone from the IT shop might decide like, <clears throat> hey, we all need our phones to be updated. Or maybe we need an upgrade. Yeah, we are still using iPhone, uh, what is it that? I can't even remember the models, to be honest. Let's say iPhone 10. Like they will say, we are all using iPhone 10 and the 11 is out. That's what a technician, someone from a technical background, engineering background, that's how they will see it because maybe it's faster. Maybe it has all of those nice features that they think it's good to them. It makes their life easy. But to an executive, they just want to know if we buy this iPhone 11, will it really, really take the business forward? 
if it, it's not, trust me, it doesn't matter what the IT shop says, a good executive will never ever spend dollars there, irrespective of what's going on, so long as there is no risk to that. So while we might ask a question like, hey, so the iOS, um, the new iPhone is out, iPhone 11, but you are using iPhone 10, and the new iPhone, iPhone 11, Apple said it's going to have all the nice features, the new security features whatsoever. From a risk management perspective, what should you do? One, upgrade your phone. Two, all of those kind of things. And then maybe there will be another question that says, huh, see how upgrading the phone will, you know, aligns with the business objectives. I'm telling you, do not select the technical errors part. Select that one that has to do with the business value objective whatsoever. All of those nice things that people in suits usually say. All right, does that answer the question? I know it takes some time. Thank you very much, Doctor. Yes, pretty much. Thank you. Doc, doctor, if I could add uh, one thing that uh, helped me with this yes. class coming from military mindset yes. is that we have to provide purpose, direction, and motivation. So therefore, always think, what is the overall purpose here? The bottom dollar. Motivation, drive the company forward. And direction, which path you want them to take. So <laughs> it's really helped, helped me out here with uh, understanding this book and the information you guys are providing. I really like that. And seriously, thank you so much for contributing. Like seriously, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, as I always say in this class, please, 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 if you have another way of seeing things, Let's make the class more of a conversational kind of thing where you really bring in something, you know? Chances are right now there's also another person with a military background that will instantly connect with, again, I apologize, I can't remember any, but yeah, that will instantly connect with what was just being said. So yeah, thank you so much for adding that. By the way, I do find a lot of people from military background enjoying that ATO side of things, the compliance, well, not necessarily enjoying it, but because it has this waterfall approach not agile like the step one two three so it can be meticulous i find people with military backgrounds kind of constantly connecting with it all right um so risk culture it's there what does that mean i don't want to hear the definitions again but what are we talking about any anyone so doctor uh, risk culture <laughs> comes down to what is senior management willing to accept, what is senior management willing to tolerate, and what is senior management willing to step up responsibility for without assigning blame. If okay. there is a, uh, if the company's quick to assign blame to individuals, those individuals may not come up with um, solutions that are outside of the box. But if a company decides to actually reward individuals, even if they fail, for thinking outside the box, you're going to get more MacGyver style ideas than people who are just going to follow the book. That's true. Um, I agree with that. Uh, you look at risk culture, definitely, definitely it's most times, I'm not going to say always, but most times it is leadership driven, right? Leadership set the tone of how the organization is. And it's just like governance, truly. Different administrations set different tones on how they are based on their own policies, same thing with leadership. And every organization have its own culture. I believe we all know that. And just like it is very important for us as individuals to make sure that the organizations we go to, their organizational culture align with ours, same thing with risk. It tends to define, the organizational culture defines the organizational attitude, the organization's response towards that risk. Most times, again, it's leadership driven in that sense. I have a, an example here. Um, so personally for me, I used, to, I mean, I come from an engineering background, uh, so a lot of you who are technical will relate to this. We kind of like have this mindset of being detailed in our approach. Uh, you, either you're writing your code or whatsoever, but there has to be some structure to things, right? And um, I don't know what I was thinking. I threw myself into consulting. 
And uh, yeah, it's a different ball game, right? For the consultants in here, you know, because you pretty much sometimes wake up in the morning, you don't know what is gonna hit you. Uh, I went in there, I learned a lot, but it wasn't a fit. And um, when I look at it, I relate it to, okay, my own personal way of things does not align with the organizational culture. And as much as we can sit down and complain like, ah, oh, this place is terrible, this place is horrible. It is very, very important for us to understand where we are getting ourselves into, right? Because consultants, they are in the business of solving different type of problems. So as a consultant for me, I should expect different kind of things to hit me from different angles, unlike a, an organization that is just focused in doing one thing. Now, why am I talking about myself instead of talking about risk? This is the part where you find leadership truly, truly defines the culture of the organization, irrespective of the organizational mission, the goal, the objectives. Um, it could be the DOD. Well, actually, let's stick to consulting. It could come from, uh, it could be consulting, as I was saying, where basically different things get, comes from different places, right? And uh, you will find someone, let's say I am the person based on the example I gave, and I ended up being the CEO of a consulting firm. And I'm trying to now project my personality into what the organizational culture is going to be. Whether it works or not, there will be effect to that. Um, it could work, it could not. And uh, it's part of a risk. Another thing is you look at a place like say the DOD where a lot of people in the military have a mindset of, you know, that following the chain of command, uh, there is really well clearly defined structure of how things are done. I mean, even this compliance, we are talking about all of these ATU and whatsoever, DOD has always, like the Pentagon has always set the tone in terms of all of these, this, let's check these boxes before we do the last. And then um, imagine someone coming entirely from a non-DOD background, non-military whatsoever, but because civilian, I mean, at least in the US, I think, please someone correct me, but still the Congress, uh, sorry, the Pentagon answers to the um, civilian arm. So you find someone entirely with zero military background whatsoever, then coming in to lead these people who pretty much have this structure in place, this culture in place, what happens? There could be risk, it could work. But all of these things beyond just IT, it truly, truly defines part of that organizational risk. We look at how some, their appetite towards risk is they embrace it. Some, they discourage it, some, they ignore it. Some, there is something that is considered a violation. They just want to shove it under the rug. Some, they want to put it out there. Still, that's all part of that organizational risk. Now, if you have someone coming from a defense background who is used to protecting information whatsoever, and you put them as the head of Walmart, IT whatsoever, they are dealing all of the Walmart infrastructure. Don't be surprised if they lock everything down. Don't be surprised if they made those websites like very hard for you to actually access, where they need you to put gazillions password before you actually reach what you need. Now from Walmart's viewpoint, in as much as that person, yeah, he is good with security and the CISO title is good, but from a business perspective, yeah, that isn't a good choice because a lot of, I mean, one risk I could identify is customers will be frustrated and then they'll start flocking to Amazon, right? Um, to do their shopping. Any question on this? Am I making sense or am I just, no, being too chatty? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, that's, I'm sorry? Yeah, I, I would tell you that it does make sense, right? So I can just tell you from a DOD perspective, right? The 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 perspective we had earlier was more pride ourselves in defense and, and be able to protect where, where we're seeing now with the old domain C2 environment is that it's, it's really about 
hunting and going out and, and pursuing. So it goes back to your point about the value of the business, right? Uh, and, and how we uh, measure risk and, and appetite and, and tolerance and all the things that you're talking about is it's really like, like you've been trying to describe to us. It's, it's all about the business. That's absolutely true. And um, again, thank you so much for the input. Yep. Now, um, that's certainly true. Now, how will that affect us? Like, I don't know if any of you is asking like, well, I mean, I'm not in BOD or I'm not going to Walmart. I'm just a PhD student talking about uh, taking a class and I honestly don't care about risk management. I'm just an engineer who wants to get my PhD and I'm out. Now, here's the thing. It will still affect you because that culture is the, well, I wouldn't say the major thing, but it has a huge impact in terms of that leadership perspective as well as how you're approaching compliance, how you're approaching even as little as allocation of budgets for the IT department. Someone who understands the need for that will now allocate resources for that. And again, more money to the security or cybersecurity or IT shop does not translate to the best thing. Keep in mind, you might have a cybersecurity degree, you might have an IT degree, all of that, but the minute you are working for an organization, yeah, that's your specialty. But the bigger picture is you making sure the business moves forward. So there could be situations where actually putting money in the IT shop isn't necessarily the most valuable thing to do. The most valuable thing to do is maybe, you know, upgrading the waiting room so customers feel, <laughs> feel good when they come in. So all of those things, those culture, cultural things really matters. Then we have the communication part, right? Um, I think I was reading something from Warren Buffett where he was, is it Warren Buffett? I can't remember, but he was saying something about he will never ever invest in a company like Tesla, no matter how much it is growing. Why is that? A lot of people are seeing Elon Musk as just a hot-headed person. As I mentioned earlier, who goes in, <laughs> who goes on Twitter just to say like their own company valuation is ridiculously high. It just doesn't even make sense. Again, it's all part of the communication. Now people who are really risk averse might be like, uh, it will be discouraging. There's this story of um, someone from uh, when BP had that oil spill or something like that. Uh, why did I get this example from? Oh, I remember there's this lady who talks, uh, she teaches CISSP classes and things like that. I think I was reading to one of our MP3 and she gave this example of when BP oil spill happened, apparently was it their CEO or someone in the leadership came out and made a statement by saying, no one has been impacted by this spill like he has. He's been having sleepless night. When you think about it, a lot of people died. Some lost a lot of families. Some, I mean, the water is no longer habitable for a couple of years and whatsoever. But that communication actually tanked BP's um, stocks. So again, whether you're in the IT shop or you're in the cyber or whatsoever, the minute your organizational <laughs> stocks starts going down, your company is losing value. It, I mean, beyond cyber, it actually poses a risk to you as well as a person. You might end up losing a job. I mean, the company might decide not to, you know, maybe the IT shop cuts so much. So yeah, we're just gonna outsource it and uh, we're gonna cut that place. So truthfully, the communication, the culture, it's something that all risk professionals must pay attention to when identifying risk. Because you can come with the nice documentation and guidelines and templates of how to do things, but if the leadership is not receptive to it, it's not gonna work. So what mixture makes cyber risk? It also involves your, it, uh, leadership behavior towards risk. Some are a bit more conservative where they are kind of risk averse. So as such you go in an organization, can anybody give me an organization, just an, a high level, no long discussion of any organization that you will see like they are very risk averse when it comes to cyber security or IT, let's limit it to that. Any organization, you know? So financial, everything. Okay. Yeah, I would say the U.S. Federal Reserve. 
Oh yeah, <laughs> that I agree. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, U.S. Federal Reserve, absolutely. Financial, I'm kind of uh, in the middle. I mean, when you look at Wells Fargo, it doesn't say that, but okay. <laughs> um, Sir, uh, medical? Medical field, risk averse. I apologize, uh, risk averse. Uh, yes, they lock down everything when it comes to paperwork. You must have all kinds of documents signed to even get a uh, medical report, sir. Okay, so in that maybe when we say, when we talk about uh, PII and those kind of health record, if we say the uh, um, risk of us, I will take that. But in terms of just general health operation, especially within hospitals, I don't think they are risk of us and they shouldn't be, by the way. They should take more risk because imagine a nurse and uh, that needs to, uh, I mean, you know, that little computer thing, the electronic devices that they tend to push around, which basically keeps all patient records, including their medication or whatsoever. Imagine having to put so many password, two-factor authentication, some notifications you have to whatsoever before you're able to log in. I don't think it's the best approach in that situation. And that's one of the reasons why you, I'm sorry? Uh, sorry, so I, I, I'm working with the military hospitals uh, from Bethesda, Bethesda down yes. to the hospitals in Fort Bragg. I can yeah. tell you that they, before they start the work, that they have to log in. They have to carry a chip card with them at all times to be able to access the networks to type in their password and at the same time to log into specific records such as psychological records or prescriptions. They have to have a separate card to access that database and to dispense medicine. Um, people have to approve it before medicine can be dispensed. I 100% agree with you. It's actually a HIPAA control as it, around the NIST 800-53. I think then um, I should clarify a little bit. I wasn't talking about necessarily the implementations. Like you have, if you have a PIV card and you just slot it in and then it allows you to just log in, the process is smoothly, right? Whereas if you put many controls that makes it difficult to operate, then as such, that is the part of risk of us I'm thinking of. Let's take, for example, again, the DOD. If, uh, again, some of you in this class, you're not gonna stop hearing this. We are in Nova, so basically DOD is all our life, right? <laughs> Pentagon and whatsoever. But yeah, um, let's take, for example, um, the DOD. Um, actually get into the Pentagon. Many hurdles for you to cross before you go in there. Let's talk about like the airline industry. Um, I would say well, in terms of the operation, they can be a bit risk averse as well. But yeah, I agree with you, I guess. That's why I said I'm in defense when it comes to the health. There are other sites that are really strict, by the way. But yeah, okay. That's one. Yeah, so, so if I could, I, I would add to that, right? So, so I think from a risk culture, I think things are changing, right? So I know in DOD, um, you know, kind of like I was mentioned before, we, we pride ourselves on protection where, where now I think the, the strategy more is, is hunt and go out there. Uh, I know, for example, zero trust, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the mechanisms are opening up. So, you know, you, you kind of see where those infiltrations are coming from and you go out there and, and search and, and kind of capitalize on. So I, I really think uh, just a perspective, right? That the, uh, the risk culture is changing, and, and I think the zero trust and, and what we see in this new normal of COVID is, is changing attitudes. Just my thoughts, over. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely agree with that um, around zero trust. But at the same time, I'm also seeing, I mean, you look at like army futures, it's even becoming more risk averse, to, to be honest. Uh, there are other aspects that when you take it from that angle, then you also see, I think the DOD is just complex, seriously. It just depends on which side of DOD we're talking about. Like I look at all of these now um, on the recon part of things which I guess is what you're talking about a little bit as well. On the recon part, yes. the intel gathering, gathering, we are, I would say, are the DODs embracing, even though it's more of a, an intelligence kind of thing, but it's still also embracing it and willing to adopt certain things. But then you also look at 
now how DOD is shifting from that methodologies that they used to use to now like the DevSecOps approach and whatsoever. So again, it's just the DOD, seriously. You find someone coming from, <laughs> from the cyber sector of like a place like NGA, which I don't know, is NGA, DOD or Intel? I can't even tell, it's in between. You find someone coming from like NGA, they have- They're company. both DOD and Intel. They are both, right? Oh God. <laughs> so you find someone coming from like NGA and um, they have a completely different approach to things. And then someone coming from like DHA, um, the Defense Health, they are completely different as well. I think DOD is just everything in a single bowl. But yeah. Um, any other organization you can think of that is, you will say it's no risk taken? I think we gave some couple of ones here. Any other one? Like we're using one actually right now, and they took a hit for it. There are VoIP, VoIP technologies, Zoom. Yep, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So say, yeah. uh, Zoom is more risk taken, even though, I mean, uh, <laughs> the industry kind of came after them, the cyber industry, especially those technical people. It came after them up hard where they are now implementing more mechanisms. But, I mean, there used to be, you know, we're just in the business of communication. There, I mean, we are not um, IL-456 or carrying any sensitive conversations or even FedRAM authorizer whatsoever. We are not in the business of making a tool that is meant to be used for classified conversation. We're just in the business of, you know, lectures for schools to embrace it and just friends to have a chit chat. So who cares if there is someone listening to it? As such, they kind of took this position of this risk-taking mindset and COVID happened. And uh, all of a sudden, boom, everybody, including, I mean, including the government sector, they were really thinking of ramping up and uh, fast-tracking Zoom to get FedRAM authorized because truthfully, Zoom is easier to use than tools like WebEx that require so much integration. So, they came under the head. And I think they are changing their position on a lot of things. Last I heard, they are trying to get for drums as well as all of those things. So they would begin changing position or at least maintain that side of the willingness to be flexible by letting the consumer decide what the risk should be. Because I, the way I see it, they are now taking that approach on the tool by passing on that responsibility of you can encrypt the communication if you want or you can put the password or whatsoever if you want by yourself without us having to do it so there is that okay that's all kind of around behavior towards risk now when we think about it another thing that really really impacts a lot is that lack of transparency in as much as different organiza uh, organizations differ, you will find that sometimes if something happens, especially around spills, data, whatsoever, especially in the US, yeah, with everything being transparent, you will find uh, certain things, we just don't want them to be out on the media, right? And uh, again, I don't have any, <laughs> military background but it's something i know like within the cyber uh the cyber side of things again dod you find some people feel like our cyber strategy and whatsoever that the dod always released annually it's oversharing right so there are people that feel like no this is the dod strategy on things in as much as it doesn't provide the implementation guide but highlighting the strategy, some feel like it's kind of oversharing. But then there are also <laughs> mechanisms in the US that requires that, especially around taxpayers' money. So what happens when something goes wrong? There are organizations that do not want any negativity to come out. Some are willing to embrace it. Again, should the book, as you guys are reading it, as you guys are reading the Isaka book, you will find that the book, it's more on this approach of a learning culture, growth culture, um, really embracing that transparency. 
if we are talking about our personal opinion, that's what I am. But I also, I am beginning to understand the value of certain organizations that truly choose not to share certain information. I can maybe understand why the DOD might decide not to declassify certain information in as much as the entire media and everybody is asking for it because maybe when you put it from a risk perspective, the catastrophe is going to resolve into might actually be more damaging. I can also see both sides of things on like, why the heck did Edward Snowden did that? Or what he did is right. If we are talking about taking me as a person out of the picture, I can rationalize both. One can say, oh, by doing that, there is a tendency what? of actually having other people get what? impacted. I'm sorry? Can everybody please go on mute, if you don't mind? Uh, Dave, can you help me put everyone on mute, please? Then um, there is also that looking at it from why the heck did he, um, did Edward Snowden did what he did? Uh, Maybe it could resolve into impact. Maybe a lot of spies across the world now, their identity will be out. All of these things, which really, really could be a case of dead or alive. Now, is it worth it to spill all the information because of this? Uh, I mean, at the expense of one person's life? Trust me, if we are to rationalize it, I absolutely understand when people say, no, it's not worth it. Now, I also understand where people are saying, no, what the heck? This is taxpayers' money. We should not be in the business of monitoring other people. People should feel safe. Why am I being paid to be surveilled, um, uh, paid uh, just for surveillance on myself and things like that? So again, the book will push you more towards that transparency. It is not a bad thing, especially if you are in the business of making money, right? Again, if you're in the business of answering to other people, keep in mind that ISACA is mostly, I would say 99.9% implemented within organizations, right? Corporate places and whatsoever, including the COVID controls are more corporate focus. So yeah, there is that learning culture and the blaming culture. What is a blaming culture? You find in an organization where if you know you make a mistake, instead of when you come forward, truly people are gonna throw you under the bus or it's gonna cost you your job. I mean, people will not come forward with that, right? With that information, especially if they do not have any leverage. A such blaming culture could also present a risk. So let me give an example. Let's say I work in the IT shop and I am a network administrator responsible for maybe implementing some firewall controls whatsoever, right? And um, I was tasked to make the decision of which device, I'm the technical person, I know the technical devices. So I'm, I was tasked with being the person to identify which device should we get to satisfy maybe blocking certain type of traffic. TikTok, for example, which means if you are going to block TikTok, you definitely need something operating at the application layer, right? a firewall, maybe some sort of application layer firewall. And I went ahead and just bought a firewall that's operated at the network layer. So it only blocks IP addresses and port numbers, nothing application, like you can't even decide uh, uh, to filter traffic at the application layer. But we know, I know that the problem we're trying to solve is TikTok related. Maybe it's Marimon. Do you feel like students are always on TikTok? So <laughs> um, if I know that you know, going forward with the mistake I did will actually cost me my job. I will, instead of going forward, I will begin to identify how can I mend it myself? How can I patch this whatsoever? Instead of actually returning the device to get a replacement. Whereas if the organization is willing to embrace those kind of negative outcomes, you might find like, okay, that's fine. It's just an error. Let it be kind of a learning moment for you and let's go do the right thing. At the end of the day, we are solving the problem. So again, behaviors truly, truly impact organizational risk. Now, just to quickly touch on, um, can I, is there anyone who doesn't see how what we are talking aligns with identifying risk? Please be 
upfront is totally fine, seriously. It's quite important for us to know like all the things we are talking about again, uh, aligns with what we are trying to achieve in the class, similar to the business thing, right? So what we are doing aligns with the objective of the class. Today's objective is to be able to identify risk. So is there anyone who feels like all of these risk contract, communication, all of these things, how do they align with identifying risk? Yeah, so, so I'll add to that. Uh, I, I think this is so interesting and I, I, I probably will inject now because when we get to the technical part, I probably won't be as, as intrigued or uh, uh, pr provocative. But uh, for example, what you're, you're laying out here, right, the, the blaming culture and the learning culture. So I work in the uh, United States Marine Corps and, and, and I grew up in the blaming culture and, and we're really taking strides right now to develop the learning culture, right? So I think you have some understanding of DOD. We, we, we do things in a doctrinal perspective, right? So we have a new uh, doctrine on learning, right? So we're starting to see the value, going back to your point, the value in, in bringing governance and compliance and risk together. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, there's a new normal out there, and, uh, and, and I really am intrigued on this part here because uh, it, it's so, so integral to, to, you know, the hard work that goes to, I'm sure, the, the follow-on chapters that we got in uh, sections two, three, and four of the ISIC uh, manual. So I hope that helped over. That's very great to hear. I'm uh, really glad we have someone who actually has um, experience firsthand on the other side of things. Uh, please continue to contribute as uh, we touch on these things. Um, you just mentioned something and I just remembered how as a risk professional, truly, your job translate, uh, transcends um, just the cyber. I know we're talking about IT risk, but <laughs> right now, uh, last year, the gen, what did they call it? Is it Gen Z? Yeah. Okay, after millennials, there's a Gen Z, right? The Gen Z got into the workforce. And I am telling you, like it or not, they are different. You think uh, millennials were considered different? Gen Z are different. They don't want, they actually hate the idea of even sitting in an office. They just wanna be out there in Costa Rica and they're working remotely. Don't micromanage them, they just want to, <laughs> you to tell them what needs to be done and when it should be done. It's none of your business if they want to do it from, I don't know, some really, really fancy vacational treat or who cares? You will just get the job done. And the industry in itself, a lot of things that are now having to bring in like this new workforce, like these new gen, uh, these gen Z that have started joining the workforce, any organization that is not willing to accommodate their way of things, they're going to be out of business. That's just it. Or they are going to find it very challenging to retain talent, especially these days where, I mean, I, I'm a millennial, so I relate to that. Listen, don't make me sit in front of a TV just to watch something at 9 p.m. If you can't make it on demand, I'm not gonna watch it. I don't care how good it is. Blockbuster, no, nah, I don't care. Make it on Netflix, similar to on demand. So every industry truly definitely needs to look at that culture as well as um, things. So for someone as a risk professional, again, one's job will transcend IT. Just because you're a CISO doesn't mean your job is limited to just that. You are in the business of moving the company forward. So. What does that mean? If you see an organization is not willing to accommodate remote work, that's a green light. Uh, sorry, a red light in terms of, yeah, there is a risk over there, especially in this day and age. Or especially if it depends on a, that part of the population that really need those remote work functions, right? So, all right. Yeah, I would say you're, you're spot on. And, and, and in DOD, just a quick example, uh, Defense, defense Digital Service, we, we accomplished that in the last two or three years. And, and if you ever go to their office spaces, uh, it looks a lot different than what you see in the Pentagon. But to your point, yep, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
I agree. I mean, even the entire defense sector now looking into how can we actually allow people to work in skills remotely. I mean, I want to see how that works out. I want to see how the entire defense sector will change their approach or rather the way they do things for the past 50 years to now bring in SCIF remotely. So let's see how it works. But yeah, uh, challenging times, huh? Okay, um, behavior towards policy and compliance. I think this is pretty much uh, straightforward. Uh, every organization, no matter how little, either needs to satisfy some compliance or even if they don't need to, if you're just in a cupcake business, you might think you don't have any compliance, but I assure you there is. Maybe nobody is checking it, but yeah, that could be limitation to the sugar content. There could be limitation to a lot of things. Maybe you're not allowed to sell maybe um, cupcake that is 50 days old. Please don't do that, but yeah. <laughs> Those are part of compliance, right? So what's an organizational behavior towards compliance? towards policy, as well as drafting its own internal policy, making sure that people that work within the organization, no matter how flexible we try to be, but at the same time, there has to be key things that everybody aligns with. Again, what are those? Those organizational business objectives, those things that will present risk. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, now let's take, 10 minutes and be back by 8.55. Uh, Let's take a break. Is that okay? Wait. Sure thing. Be back by when? Uh, in the next 10 minutes. Just 10 okay. minutes. 10.55. Yep. I know, very odd time, but it's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, still on that, um, on the communication part, right? We have spent some cycles on uh, <laughs> talking about the risk risk. Let's talk about the communication. There are multiple ways um, organizations communicate, right? Depending on which level. But definitely we can all agree that openness uh, definitely plays a key role when it comes to uh, defining how organizational culture like basically when it comes to understanding and defining organizational culture. Openness in the sense of, openness could be from organizational wide and it could be just your immediate level or skip level. So the idea of working with for someone, be it your manager or the organization entirely without knowing what you are meant to achieve from a business perspective, yeah, I don't see that working. Please let me know if you have any experience where you're just working for a place with no clarity on what the either your immediate responsibility or the entire organizational objectives are. You might not know the details, but I think the, we can all agree that the overarching um, expectation has to be clear. Now, when it comes to expectation, what are ways that organization uh, communicate, right, and set those expectations. And again, just reflecting on basically the first part of this class is we need to know these to be able to identify the risk and the risk could be when we don't see these effective uh, uh, communications uh, things in place or when we see out, um, outliers in the cultural aspect of things, right? So every organization, no matter what, should have some form of a strategy. Yeah, maybe not every employee should have access to that policy, the procedure, the awareness or whatsoever, but every organization definitely needs to have some of form of their objectives, goals, and their mission in place. So as a risk professional, you are brought into an organization and you're, ask, you're being asked like, hey, help us identify what are our cyber, IT, whatever kind of risk uh, we currently have and how we can go out towards really um, uh, treating those risks. And then um, as a risk professional, truthfully, your first question has to go around, what are you guys trying to achieve, right? Since there is no checklist for exactly what, 
uh, what risk is applicable to every single industry or every single organization. So as such, as a risk professional, you go and you ask, what are you guys trying to achieve? Or can you please share your procedural documentations or policies or your missions or goals or objectives with me? And then you find a situation where they don't even have one or you find it very challenging for the CEO to tell you truly what they're trying to achieve, right? I mean, yeah, that's the time where as a risk professional, you are going to put in the brakes and say, you know what, let's take a step back. Let's actually make sure that we understand what we are trying to achieve over here first, right? Before even going in to say like, okay, at the IT level or at the cyber level or this, you have these problems. Um, again, uh, I remember a friend telling me how he decided not to truly join. Well, it's a startup and uh, just two people in the company and he was meant to be the third person. And um, he flat out asked them like, what are you hoping to achieve? And they couldn't articulate it. I mean, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't go to a place like that. Same thing. So the expectations must be set for every organization. Setting the status, right? When we talk about, this is more on that risk manage, manager kind of responsibility as well. Setting those risk profiles. So now you know what the organization is trying to achieve. As such, it allows you to really set the risk profile. What is risk profile? Anybody just really short, 10 seconds is fine. What do you think is a risk profile? You can use the direct definition of a profile. Anyone? I don't know if you are having it over chat. Feel free to unmute yourself this, and just go with us. This is Jonathan. Um, I'd say all the factors surrounding the risk. Like what, what, what is it comprised of? Okay, as the risk profile. So when you talk about that, it means you have already identified the risk to be able to then have it based on your saying all of those things around the risk. Fair to say? Yes, sir. Only you may not know it. Okay, but then- Being you, the organization, right? They know that they have a risk, they just don't know what makes it a risk. Okay, that's a fair assessment. And um, by the way, you will stumble a lot across <laughs> these vague things as you are studying for different, especially if you are taking different certifications. When you look at the government side from like NIST approach, they actually see risk profile as you have already fleshed out everything and you know your position, similar to your definition. But unfortunately, from ISACA viewpoint, I don't know why they always do this. Seriously, even ISC Square has a different way of it. But from ISACA approach, they see risk profile as actually that early indicator of, okay, you know, because this business is now Walmart and they are in the business of making profit and they have a goal of, making 10 billion this, uh, this year. As such, we now have kind of all of these profiles that will allow us to now understand what, are, what is going to be considered a risk indicator. So meaning all of these different metrics, when you put them together, they are considered the risk profile. And you, when you look at it from the government side, the government, uh, well, at least from NIST, including when you look at it from Actually, uh, DOD, this aside, you see it more as the risk profile as, okay, you have finished identifying all of those things and you have put together and this is considered your risk profile, be it your low, moderate, or high. Not just those metrics that needs to come into the picture. Um, so yeah, this is more of a nuance around the different uh, providers, seriously. In this case, we are seeing risk profile as, okay, you identify the organizational goals, objectives, all of those things, and you are able to say, okay, based on this business, they are in the business of making profit, they want like part of their goal for maybe fiscal year 20 or for the next decade is they want to have a, a profit of a hundred billion or one million, it depends. <laughs> and then you put all of those things, now you're building a profile. 
and then it allows you to identify okay based on these profiles you are going to continuously reference like okay if we see this in place and it's going to impact any identifier or any of these indicators that we identified due to that profile then we will consider it as a risk right and uh, we throw in just lots of data and like as the book when you're reading the book you will see that the uh, putting together these governance policy related things and then they're also margin it with the IT. Again, they did that intentionally and I'll be honest, it makes it a bit difficult to consume because it requires you to be changing hearts at once from when am I bringing in the governance, non-technology rationale and when am I considering the governance but only from a technology perspective. So again, a risk and uh, indicator could be loss of data, truthfully. But loss of data, not from the action viewpoint, but more from if we lose a data, it's going to impact us this way. As such, we are going to have it as a key risk indicator. So those kind of things. And then next we have that capability, right? Um, the capability is more around we have identified these indicators, not the risk. And now we're going to look into are we capable of managing if something like this is to happen. Now I will take it all the way back, all the way back to, I think the second or third slide that we touched upon around risk capacity and risk tolerance. Risk tolerance more on, that it will be more on, okay, this is, when this happens, we can take it for this long period of a time. Risk capacity, you also see it from that. If this happened, we can take it for this prolonged period of a time until it begin to impact us, right? Now, when you bring it back to this capability from a risk communication, you are now talking about the process. Are we able to handle this? Um, Walmart. If one of our data center phones, are we able to handle it? Uh, based on where we are right now, no, we are not going, we will not be able to handle it. As such, we also know that if this data center goes out, then our website is down. So let's make sure we are able to handle it. Okay, then we're gonna build a second data center that is considered maybe uh, a hot data center and all um, our data are going to be replicated. Right, so that is around that capability, and that is part of that risk management you'll keep hearing about. It. Now, imagine making every organization figure this out for themselves. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. Guess what? That is why we have the ISACA. That is why we have the NEST doing things. That is why we have all of these ISO whatsoever. They are meant to target a certain sector. Uh, you look at maybe um, the health sector. You can say HIPAA. It's meant to look at, okay, general speaking for the entire health sector, these are the things that we identify that when you have them in place, it means you're capable of withstanding this, right? So I always say this. And well, not necessarily just me said, saying it because that is what it is. All of the compliances you're seeing as well as all of these maturity model, the different standards and whatsoever, they are meant to be just baseline, the minimum required. What is happening these days is you find a lot of organizations just implementing it, like the minimum and saying, okay, we are in compliance. Yes, that is because everybody just sees it more from a compliance perspective where we are doing it just to satisfy a requirement. We are not doing it to help ourselves. We are not doing it to add value. When you see it from that angle, then you begin to realize implementing risk in itself, there is a reason why they call it a baseline. It is considered the minimum. Meaning beyond that, every organization should actually look into furthering it. Like, okay, for us, this organization specific, we might need to do this additional things to cover a certain gap. Uh, I would say maybe in the industry that happens, but I can tell you the government, yeah, good luck with that. 
I don't know, is there anyone here who is within any of the government sector that will tell me like, you have identified maybe this project or this thing you're deploying this technology you're deploying should be Fedram High and here you are looking at how, sorry, not Fedram High, maybe like, um, let's say DOD, maybe IL-5. And then you're looking at it like, you know, at IL-5, let's see which additional controls should we add even beyond that just to make make sure we're in a good place. Or do most of us see it like, oh my God, this is just, this ATU thing is just hard. I hate this. You know, let's just do what we, what needs to be done to get the authorization and just move forward. It's a good Yeah, yeah what, what, what I would say looking at this slide here, right, the, the, uh, the orange here, the expectations, that's mm -hmm. more in our governance realm. Uh, mm -hmm. The risk profile, like you defined it there in terms of the, portfolio is, is more the, the investment. And mm -hmm. then the capability there, I kind of align it to uh, more the design, right? The, how, we, how we design the infrastructure. So that's how I'm kind of shaping my mental model on the risk culture and communications. That's what we're trying to design in, in DOD. And, and you're right, we're, we're gonna need a lot of luck with that and a lot of hard work. Yeah. <laughs> I am really liking how you are mapping these things to actually different um, uh, definition and perspective and they actually are accurate. So I honestly, honestly appreciate it, especially now that you said the design, the implementation and the design implementation, all of those things, they truly are where you pick either the ISACA COVID-5 or the NIST controls or the ISO standards or whatsoever. Basically, at the end of the day, what are you doing? Implementing it and uh, making sure what you're, you are designing it in line with those requirements, right? Um, I am of the viewpoint, honestly speaking, that it's a bad approach, but I mean, we'll see if the industry will change, but there is a clear reason why even looking at it from the DOD side, we have the, not just the DOD, the US government side, we have that section of selecting controls. In an ideal situation, is, it is meant to be selecting actually to align with your business, not just selecting because you have identified like a system should be moderate. So you're just selecting moderate controls. No, it should be you are implementing moderate controls, but they are considered the minimum. And now you're going to add to what is considered your organizational specific controls as it moves you. But yes, thank you for that, by the way. Um, again, these are all part of the communication, right? So again, this is truly kind of straightforward around what are different factors, right, around risk. Again, these are just the elements of risk. We can look at it. Obviously, we all know the capabilities around risk governance, risk management. We just touched on that. We also kind of um, uh, understand the different um, cu cultural impact and whatsoever. But then where do we expect risk to come from? A lot of places, right? Could be from external sources, that's in an external context or internal, the risk management capabilities, the IT related capabilities, right? Vulnerabilities, we look at that. Where can we get any weakness that will result into any impact, right? If, before it even becomes a threat. Physical, network, all of these things. Is there anybody who does not understand how we are saying, oh, the network itself could present some vulnerabilities? Anybody wanna give me just an example of vulnerability that can be in place at a network layer or something like that from maybe your organizational network from a technical perspective? You're saying as employees? Be it as employees or anything, just any oh. vulnerability you can think of. From yeah, let's uh, let's just let's just take any standard corporate network and have an employee accidentally plug a switch into it. Ah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good one. Uh, definitely seeing that network from a technical perspective. I like that. Um, it'll, can it'll take the whole thing down. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. 100% agree with that, especially from a technical perspective. But then when you look at it from a governance, non-technical implementation, can you see any, can you identify any vulnerability that truly is network related, but more from a governance perspective 
rational decision that results the lack in of uh, IT asset management. IT asset management, yeah, could result into me walking over there and just literally saying like, yeah, I've returned my device, you know, and you actually didn't give me any device, so I have it at home. That would be well, great. You know, I was going to say it was more the, yeah, the visibility, the, the non-visibility of IT asset management is a, is a vulnerability, over. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. That is why I was saying like if there is no uh, inventory, right, basically. Uh, that IT asset management and organization give me their laptop, like, here is this laptop, but nobody tagged it. Nobody collected that uh, record, like, yeah, it was issued to Ibrahim. I mean, I can say, like, nobody gave it to me, and here I am with a really good device. So, I would say not having yeah. um, any kind of benchmarks, like standards, like CRS policy benchmarks, the baseline Absolutely. network Absolutely. assets, so mm -hmm. configure them to some kind of standard. Yep. Sir. Yep, that is 100% uh, agree. Imagine having no standard, no baseline, as you mentioned, and then <laughs> I am the system admin. We got this switch or firewall, and I configured it, and uh, I just configured it to my taste how I want it, right? And it's working. Everything is good, but then I just stepped out, and I got hit by the bus. Now you have to hire another system admin who doesn't even know what the heck I did. That's a risk. Yeah. So um, all of those things, I agree. I mean, we are now in remote work whatsoever, and you mm -hmm. decided, uh, you know, not to give any budget towards VPN implementation. That's also network related. All of these things can happen. Supply chain, anybody? What kind of risk present itself? Can present itself? I'm looking one from a technical perspective and another from a non-technical capacity. Supply chain, anybody? So, source of origin. Okay, that's a very good one. Do you see it more as a technical or non-technical? Uh, kind of both. It's a management yeah, oversight and it's also a technical oversight. Okay, uh, give me an example of the technical. Sorry, I wanna go down, uh, deep down on this. Uh, you could be talking um, like the, uh, the DOD CMMC stuff, right? Uh, okay. Issues, yeah. Right, so we're looking at um, adversarial threats that um, may embed vulnerable software intentionally into like camera systems. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have corporation X buys all these camera systems and then supplies them to the government or yep. attempts to. Yeah. So I also want to add to this. I agree with you, by the way. Um, I touched upon this in the intro of the class where China is saying by a certain year, all devices that are not manufactured within China, they are going to be banned for use by the government, which kind of makes sense to me mm -hmm. from that supply chain perspective, because at the end of the day, there is this, uh, there's, there's this paper. If you get the time, please just look it up. It's just four page. It's one of the, I love the paper personally. It's by Ken Thompson called Trust in Trust. In Trust. And it's just talk about how it did, it, uh, it spoke at a code level, but you can apply it anywhere. It spoke about how if you are not the person who designed something or built something, you really are not trusting that the device is secured enough. Basically around code, like if you didn't code something, you are not saying that the code is secure, but rather you're trusting the entity that coded it. So you look at Windows, right? Or any device, if you feel comfortable using Windows, by saying like, okay, I mean, I'm doing all the right things, everything is good. You are not really saying that Windows is secure, but rather you're trusting that Microsoft is doing the right thing. So let's go back to China. If China decides to consume you as devices, they might trust the device, but do they trust you as enough to not put some malware in place that allows them, allow the US to monitor things? That's the rationale there. Same thing, Huawei, for example, how we are having this uh, interesting uh, debate on IOC last year, where the US is really looking into banning Huawei and whatsoever because it just doesn't trust it. So these are all supply chain related. When you look at it from the technical angle, as you earlier mentioned, it's just as easy as putting a malware, right? Mm. Uh, again, you don't even know which, how many hands it has passed true before it got to you. Um, again, trust issues. Remember when the US government said like all Kapaski product must be 
uh, it should not be used within the government. And I still believe it is not. At some point, Kapowski truly, truly is one of the best antivirus. But the US government still doesn't use it. So all of these could be related to supply chain. We're not talking about cloud. Good luck having any US government agency using Alibaba cloud. Or good luck having any Chinese <laughs> government using um, any of these US cloud providers. I don't care if it's AWS, Azure, or whatsoever. They're never going to use it. Even if, I mean, even having the data center over there, they are putting blockage to it, right? There is a reason why they are not going to use Google products. So we're facing off. We are just in the chaos of TikTok and whatsoever. Why TikTok? Because there is this issue of it is collecting so many Americans' records, but then the data is, there is a chance that the data will be moved elsewhere. So these are all possibility of vulnerabilities, right? It doesn't, it is not the risk yet, even though the way we're presenting it, we may see it as a risk, but it is not necessarily the risk unless we have one, unless we know that there is a likelihood of that event happening. And where, even if there is a likelihood, there is an impact to the objectives of that organization. So what is the likelihood of Maybe, uh, let me give a quick uh, example here around uh, maybe natural, natural uh, things. I always use Kali. So if you're from Kali, please don't be sensitive. But <laughs> there's always this joke of in a couple of years, Kali is going to fully sink in or whatsoever is not going to be there. But then you look at it, what's the likelihood that it's going to happen? Maybe it will definitely, definitely happen, right? But what's the likelihood of it happening? Is that a vulnerability? Absolutely. Is that, there is that a likelihood of it happening? Yes. Will there be an impact to like all of these major tech industries that are there? Yeah, if it were to happen, but when it is going to happen? maybe 100 years from now. So yeah, there is no risk because they don't see themselves being around doing the same thing for the next 100 years. By then they have trans sent to something. Maybe we're all in mass, who knows? So all of those things, right? So identifying the vulnerability in itself doesn't present a risk. And including even uh, if there is a likelihood of exploiting that vulnerability still doesn't present a risk unless it, there is an impact. Now, as a risk professional, this is where it gets interesting. A lot of tech folks, the engineers, the IT shop, we love identifying the vulnerabilities and we love looking at what is the likelihood. What we don't do is what is the impact on the business, not just impact on IT, but what is the impact on the business? That is a key differentiator between executive, senior management, and the IT shop. Executives are truly, truly looking at it uh, around, how does it affect us? I mean, keep telling me there is a vulnerability, keep telling me the nukes are gonna go off, keep telling me whatsoever, is it gonna affect us? No, okay, Not, I don't even wanna hear anymore. Please let me know if there's any executive here, if you think otherwise. I'm not kidding. Tell me. So assets. What are assets? I'm opening the floor here. I know it's right there. I know we said people, intellectual property, recipe, all of those things. But what is asset? What, what is an asset? The thing that has value. Ah, I like that. Throwing it the way I usually say it, but I'm not going to take it. You have to add to that. My God, he's using my own point against me. I just, okay. no, that's not fair, sir. You can use that my own ways against me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I'm listening. Uh, something of value to the organization. Okay, to the so. organization makes a difference. I agree, um, absolutely. Uh, is there anybody who doesn't know what value is? You know why I keep hesitating? Because you guys give the perfect answer. That's why. But at the same time, it sounds so much like my own answer. And I don't want that. I just want to phrase it in a different way, but I'm having a challenge coming up in a different way. So, okay, we can all agree on that. 
either way, I'm not going to give you guys. I'm not going to give you guys the point for initiative. I'm taking the credit. It's my thing. Value, it's my thing. But it's okay. We can all be on the same page. I can share on that. <laughs> but yes, anything that is, has value to the organization, right? Um, what's valuable to one organization differs to another. <laughs> I pray and hope that people are valuable to every organization. Um, <laughs> intellectual property, I can tell you, it's not valuable to every organization. Is it valuable to a place like Coke? Absolutely, yes. yes. But is, intellect, uh, is intellectual property valuable to maybe a publicly funded research place? Maybe not really. I mean, they might have patents, but I don't think so. Like, especially academia, right? We just do research and put it out there for the, you know, nice way to put it. We give ourselves a pat on the back and say, it's the benefit, uh, for the benefit of humanity, right? But either way, um, information. In as much as I love information, but seriously, information carries different value to different organizations. <laughs> information from a DOD perspective, uh, from the military perspective, from national security viewpoint is completely different from information from the library, right? In as much as maybe you have a book that is, that uh, maybe you publish a book and it's on the library shelf and people are supposed to pay for it before they get a copy. But someone, you know, tried to, we're all students, we used to do that. Did I just admit to a crime? I don't know, but you know, Maybe someone picked it up, put a copy, couple of pages without paying for it. Yeah, very unethical. Is it an asset? Yes, it is. But does it carry the same value as maybe the list of all the files across the globe? Absolutely not. Why? Because the impact differs. Maybe with the book, you lost a couple of, I don't know, dollars. And from a national security viewpoint, if that information of all the list of the spies is out, maybe they see it as <laughs> it's a life or death situation, right? So again, assets, I think we're all aligned on that. Customers are also assets to organizations. There are reputations. I mean, we keep hearing, if you are working for Amazon, I do not mean to put you on the spot, but there is this, news of Amazon is toxic, Uber is toxic, whatsoever. But guess what? They maybe don't see their employees as valuable assets, but they, I can tell you this, <laughs> they do see their customers as valuable assets. Uh, Amazon's customer service is impeccable. Everybody is admitting to that. Uber, it's reliable. So maybe it's just the value of their customers transcend that of their employees. Not picking a side here, but putting some form of value to assets. Okay. Moving on. I think we all know this confidentiality, integrity, and whatsoever, all of those cybersecurity mumbo jumbo that we love to do. But it's just ways and uh, how we tend to see things from a security perspective, right? We tend to see things from that confidentiality, integrity, availability. That is not enough, by the way. There is things like non-repudiation, right? What is non-repudiation? Even though it's not part of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, can anybody tell me? Traceability to a person and a machine action. Absolutely. Traceability, I love that. Yep. Just that guarantee that an action is carried out by something or someone, right? Mm -hmm. Connecting those objects and subjects. That's it. I really will not dwell into confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Seriously. All right. Um, I know I did skip that. If you have some challenge understanding the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, even though there's a PhD class, feel free to just reach out to me one on one and we'll catch up on that. I am willing to do that personally. Okay, so some risk strategies of the business, right? I think we have touched on all of these, you know, business related IT risk type. We have spoke about it. Senior management support, it is what? Valuable, we know that. How important it is to have senior management support, right? 
Um, what happens if there is no senior management support and change needs to happen? It starts becoming really a challenge. It starts coming from a place where we don't want, from a toxic pers uh, perspective, right? If we are looking at it from a nation where there is no change in governance and the uh, populace is really looking for a change. You are now talking about revolutions. If you are talking at it from <laughs> organizational perspective within a company, now we are now talking about all employees coming together to really turn things around, but it's going to be a pain. Whereas if we have senior management support on things, what does that present? It presents a seamless opportunity. Uh, so as a risk professional, how does that align with you? So you're the consultant, you know, you come in, in your seat from McKinsey or one of the big falls or Bain or where's the other place? I can't remember. Accenture, Boozala and all of those nice people that put their seats and go into those conference rooms with the executives. And then you go in there and then you, your um, CEO is saying like, yeah, we've been having challenge with seriously employee retainment here they are just uh it's just been difficult it's really impacting us our we are burning so much money our recruitment whatsoever and then the ceo will start saying you know what i own a, and oh before we even the ceo continues and that then they start saying like and the problem is we like all of these employees are actually selling our intellectual property uh, properties they are selling our information giving it to our competitors you know they stole the coca-cola recipe good luck doing that by the way uh, <coughs> they passed it on to pepsi now pepsi knows how to do it but the problem is we can't even connect the dots blah 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 and they finished laying it out and you as a consultant you're like okay it tells me they don't have any data did uh dlps mechanisms in place right there are no like um data protection mechanisms in place there are no all of these things so the, you keep identifying and solving the problems in your head even though you're not going to tell the ceo because if you tell them instantly they will see like oh is it that easy so you might get a lot of money so as consultants we go back home take some time so that we add value to ourselves seriously i used to be a consultant i'm not kidding anyway um moving on you were just about to step out and then the ceo said like you know the, i just don't get it like all of these all of my employees they are some of the most ungrateful people very arrogant blah 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 they now he starts complaining using all these negative terms and whatsoever and here is the ceo generalizing like all of those as a rich professional i can tell you as a consultant i'm just gonna move forward because I know if I challenge him, chances are I will lose the business. But now coming back as a risk professional, not a consultant, <laughs> you come back. <laughs> I think at that point, I will take a step back and literally ignore all of those protection mechanisms that I'm thinking that do not exist and begin looking into what is actually the organizational culture. What is the culture of the senior management? What is all of these things? We just finished talking about Gen Z. Uh, good luck micromanaging Gen Z, by the way. Um, so you are seeing all of these signs. I think it's another point of interest where as a risk professional, I'm going to take a step back and say like, okay, let's look at what are some changes that the employees have been looking into, but then maybe there's no senior management support. Maybe they want just some additional vacation days and there is none, or maybe this. Could there be all of those things that is resulting into this high turnover of everybody just leaving the company and resulting into these expenses? So it could be maybe an easy fix by bringing senior management in line by telling them like, hey, listen, based on current research, we realize it's just, you see this horrible coffee machine that you kept there that you just got from Walmart for nine bucks. It's terrible. Go get them some Keurig everybody will be around, you know? So it could be that's the support that um, senior management needs to provide. So truly as a risk professional, all I'm trying to say here is be it a cybersecurity, IT whatsoever, there's always a need for you to take a step back and look at it from a different perspective. I think you will find like some of the best risk management professionals are those that are able to take themselves out of the picture, take their solution out of the picture, 
and really <laughs> leverage on current existing problems and then solving it. That's why some people find it hard to understand the job of consultants because they feel like consultants don't have any skill set. They don't know what needs to be done. But here they are. Why are we paying these people huge money to just solve a problem that we either want to start them as a solution? I guess sometimes it aligns with also being a risk professional. All right. Um, Oh, I've said this more than a million times, a million times, I don't need to repeat it. But yes, everything we do must align with the business goals and objectives, right? Organizational structure, again, around those um, senior management support. But, and I'm saying but, especially around accountability, responsibility, and all of those things. If you have heard of a RACI chat, good. If you have not, go look it up. But there is a clear difference between who is responsible for something and who is accountable for it. If you expect, just because you are the um, IT manager with your amazing deployment skill set, very good with your coding whatsoever, and you still work for a tech company and you are there expecting the CEO to just be able to instantly connect with you and understand, yeah, um, this is how you do this, 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 this. You know what? This is fine. Go for it. <laughs> then you are heavily mistaken. Um, because why? CEOs are not responsible for deployment. They are accountable, right? You are responsible. It's not his job. It's the CEO's job to make sure it happens, but not necessarily to do it, right? And it's the same reason why sometimes some of us, let's take doctors, for example. You find, I think I'll use the example. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, if you don't mind, please. Uh, uh, everybody, can you please go on mute? Um, okay, so let's take like the hospital, for example, imagine being a medical doctor, I think I gave this example previously, but imagine being a medical doctor and um, for years, and now it's time for someone to take the throne ah, from Game of Thrones, you know? So long as the ending doesn't end like that, but it's fine. Anyway, um, it's time for someone to leave that organization. And you know, you've there been a chief medical whatsoever for ages, chief surgeon, chief neurosurgeon, and all of that. And you know, you're very confident, you're the senior person in the organization, and boom, you wake up in the morning, put your best uh, I don't know what do they call doctor's coat, the white thing, whatever it is, you know, you put the best one, looking good, and then you just walk in thinking like, yeah. Then Tabard will say, you know what? We bless you. You are the new head. You walk in there and then you see some other person coming from, some partner coming from a consultant firm is now the one that was appointed to, you know, oversee things. And you're like, what? Why? He doesn't even know anything about running a hospital. Guess what? The hospital is meant to be for profit. That person knows how to make money. That's what they're looking for. So it's all around that accountability, right? They are not looking for who is responsible for doing the job. Sometimes at that level, they're looking for who is accountable. And people that are accountable are not meant to know, have the same knowledge as people who are responsible. That's the same reason why people who are responsible should not feel the burden of those who are accountable. Again, Consulted, as it says, some people are just meant to be consulted for their expertise. Most times, those are outsourced, right? And there are those that just need to be informed, especially like around the financial sector, or you as a stakeholder. Maybe uh, if you bought some of Tesla's stock or any of the stocks that either went up or down, you should expect some annual report on how the market is doing. You might not read it if you already made some money. so. But still, you do need to be informed. Again, all part of those organizational structure. We touch on organizational culture, ethics. Trust me, it plays a lot. Why do I say ethics plays a lot? Actually, let's touch a little bit 
on that. I know this is not a psychology, sorry, a psychology or philosophy. Well, it's actually PhD, so there's, no, it's DSC. Anyway, um, it's not a philosophy class, so, but still, what do you understand ethics in the context, context of security as well as risk? How will that play a role? Anybody want to volunteer? Anyone? Okay. Well, if you're not ethical, you, you can't really, it, it mean, being ethical is at the core of, um, you know, being compliant. You know, I mean, if you're not ethical, how can you trust anything that's going on? You know, you can't trust your, your bosses, you can't trust your organization. So, I mean, at the core of everything is, is an ethical behavior. And also, uh, you know, obviously if you're being audited and you, de you demonstrate unethical behavior, then that raises a lot of other red flags. Okay, but is it? I'm not kidding. Because ethics are not laws, they are not policies, right? Well, yes, but I think okay. wouldn't, wouldn't at your core, like your, your core business statement where you de develop all your, your risk tolerances, your policies, as you mentioned, that is where you you would develop your core ethics. I mean, as the the, the book mentions, is that you know, um, all these things are tied into how the how your particular corporation or your organization views um, views themselves or views their policies, basically. So, I don't know. I feel strongly about ethics. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you do your thing. But that's how I feel no. about it. It's our thing, by the way, but okay. Um, I, so ethics has to do more with that individual perception, right? And I was actually looking at it more from how should organizations respond to individuals' perception of what is right or wrong and make sure that it does not present a risk. Let me give you a very quick example. So coming from my culture um, in Nigeria, Hausa is a tribe. We have this culture of, you'll find it also common in the Middle East, where a younger person should not look straight into the eyes of an older person because it's considered a sign of respect. In America, in the Western culture is actually considered a bit disrespectful. Like, why am I talking to you and you shine away? Even if it's now, if it actually involves a criminal act, it's even considered more of, huh, that's something is fishy. So, Coming from that background as well, it's all part of ethics, right? That's an individual perception of what is right or wrong. Now, we are not picking side based on my example by saying this is right or this is wrong. But from an organizational viewpoint, if you look at it, could it present a risk? Absolutely. There could be someone coming in with that different way of pretty much different perception and the organization need to either invest in training them to align with the organization or the organization meets that person where they are, right? I mean, we live in a different world these days where again, us millennials, I'm a millennial, so I'm entitled to saying this. Um, <laughs> us millennials, we are very entitled as such. We now want the organization to meet us where we are. We don't want to change for anything. So we don't care. Like we use, say, be more empathetic. Let the organization be more empathetic into understanding the differences. All right, taking that out of the picture. Now, in this day and age, if an organization is not willing to invest into that understanding of individual's perception, either to have a single tone of what is the organizational perception of right or wrong so that employee meets them there or the customer meets them there, trust me, it's going to present a risk. I don't know if it makes sense. Are we now on the same page? Is it not our thing, not my thing? So it makes a lot of sense. That's why you have ethics training at work, right? So, yep. that, so that they make sure that you are in alignment with the company's ethics, right? Absolutely agree. Or even business type ethics, right? And especially with stuff like travel and stuff, when you travel to different countries and stuff, just like you said, they have different cultural mores and standards. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be traveling or doing business with people outside of the United States, then um, not only does the company kind of educate you on what the 
ethics are for the company, but also for other cultures and countries, right? Yes, yes, that's a perfect way to put it, seriously. Now, do you agree that it is our thing? Because you actually gave a better example than I did. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, All right. we um, take that ethics training at work every year. That, oh, <laughs> yep, that's absolutely true. So yeah, around that ethics, right? Uh, same thing, behavior. Kind of closely aligned, but that will be a bit of a difference, but we touch on behavior and how behavior influence culture, right? Same thing with organization. Now, why are we talking about ethics, uh, cultural morals, morals, behavior, and I mean, like, you know, you guys just signed up for a cybersecurity risk management, and here we are talking about ethics. Yeah, please just don't report me to Professor Murphy and tell her I suck. Let's all get on the same page. Because guess what? You reporting me present a risk. To me, I'm Dave as well. I don't know if Dave agrees with that, but it is it presents a risk. And then you instantly becomes a threat. And then I will use the quiz as something to, you know, deter that kind of to treat the threat. Just kidding. Anyway, um, so laws, regulations, standards, compliance, all of those things, right? And uh, I think this is pretty much straightforward, right? We identify all of these things uh, that could actually ultimately result into a risk. And then we begin to have a universal language of how to approach it. What is that universal language of how to approach things? That's risk management. We have that of the list. In as much as everybody likes it, NIST 800-53, I disagree. It's the it NIST 800-37 that set the tone for US uh, risk management for non-federal systems. This is another that we can. Okay, additional areas of concern for a risk pro practitioner, IT related. My IT folks will enjoy this. Everybody knows when we look at it from a hardware, any example? I mean, you all have the slides, so I think I'm just gonna move forward here. Um, CPU, motherboards, RAM, all of those hardware related things can present themselves. But actually, I missed one thing. Why did I just make an instant switch from this kind of this strategy, this consultant thing, and then instantly jumping into I basically jumped from the consulting world to big tech. So why? Why did we do that? Because mm -hmm. IT is the business. I'm sorry, what? Because IT is the business. Okay, but then why did I start with the other one before jumping in here? Because all it takes is one unethical sysadmin working in a data center to exfiltrate all of the company's data and intellectual property. Okay. That's no value. Fair point. But at the same time, when, I, when we were talking a lot about the organizational culture, ethics, whatsoever. It's paramedic. It's like you started from the top, from the senior leadership and management and governance level, then you go down a lower level. Exactly. Thank then, you yeah. so much for putting it that top-down approach, right? Where we're looking at the governance side of things. You know, it is this way of... Yeah, everywhere might be burning, but is it really the fault of the place that is burning or is it because the top level did not put majors in place that ensures that these things will not happen, right? So it is us now coming in down level as saying like, okay, with the assumption of all of this, management did not do their job, right? Senior leadership, governance, they have not done their job. And we have even gotten to the IT area. What kind of risk would you look into as the IT um, risk professional? So that's why we're here, right? I think these are all straightforward. SDLC, software development lifecycle, right? Lack of IO, uh, input output validation. You look at it from SQL injection for my application uh, layer folks that deal with software development, you know, all of those things, hardware, you know, those things. Um, quick clarity in this. If you are not an IT professional, 
I am not looking for you to go and start looking at what is an API, right? What is IO validation? No, I'm not trying to make you go and uh, learn about all of these technical way of doing things. Even though it's very important in this class, you do not need to <laughs> know um, how to identify uh, SQL injections or maybe how to apply patches. No, absolutely not. Knowing the technologies is definitely good. Operating system layers, right? Lack of interoperability complex and then complexity, uh, complexities. What is that part of the lack of interoperability? Uh, what are we talking about? Anyone? What does that mean? Well, for example, it may mean uh, a uh, Linux server needing to communicate with a um, say a Windows 10 desktop computer, uh, mm -hmm. except they're not, you know, communicating with a common protocol, so that doesn't work. Absolutely agree. Yep, that is, that exactly it is. Or imagine, um, that's a perfect example, by the way. I'm just gonna give another one for people who are non-technical related. Now imagine, um, getting decided like okay you know all the employees of the company will get iphones okay that's fine and um, you trust iMessage as the means of communication okay that's fine but then without really thinking in depth you decide to go buy android devices for your other branch same company Maybe US, you got them iPhone because iPhone is the dominant here. And then maybe in, um, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Asia, you decide to get them Android devices because it's the dominant one. But then you completely miss the part that, you know what? We actually rely on iMessage as the communication medium and Android devices do not communicate via iMessage. What does that tell you? You have to burn additional money to now start looking into buying another application that will allow you to communicate. Maybe Zoom, maybe Teams, maybe WhatsApp, I don't know. I'm just trying to give a simplified um, example here. Does that make sense? So as a risk professional, you come into the picture, you see that, and maybe they consult you when they were trying to, um, buy those devices, but then they haven't bought it yet. You just got um, sent like, oh, hey, these are the list of things we are going to do to set up our Asia branch. And then as you're going through it, you see like, okay, everything looks good. They did the policies right, everything. Okay, it makes, they actually factored in local uh, laws. Let's just use India, for example. Local Indian laws, that's perfect. Local American laws, jurisdiction. U.S. have requirements for data, data regulation. By the way, I'm not taking that. I'm pissed that the U.S. does not have a national data regulation thing, but that's just me personal. Anyway, the U.S. Hi. have one. <laughs> the U.S. have data localization requirements as such they have done that they have taken care of all of those things you finish reading it and it's like 10 p.m and you're about to just you know call it a day and just send everything out and mistakenly you have a toddler and he kind of just push a paper and then you saw like hardware and he says oh we're getting the new i don't know the android devices but we're getting the i know they like to call it based on food so we're getting the new android sandwich and you're like wait hold on a second don't we communicate over iMessage why are they getting android devices for people in China, that's a risk. That's your job as a risk professional to capture it. That's why they are paying you the big bucks. And that's why your scope is going to be big in terms of what and what you look for. Maybe at this level, if you're starting, like if you're just starting your career, maybe you just specialize and just identify risk related to hardware. But as you're climbing the ladder, your ability to see it from the software perspective, operating system, different angles, uh, looking at it from compliance, from data regulation, all of those things. It's, it's a lot, but yeah. Okay, what next? Environmental controls, power, HVAC, I think these are common, you know? Uh, imagine my amount, you know, not putting signs around. This is the exit, and then we have a little bit of a blackout, and now people are just, you know, 
I mean, even environmental, we know like they are, uh, that's why we have population, uh, number limits on elevators, all of those things, they are risk because guess what? You are the risk professional. Yes, they said IT. Yes, it's a data center, but that data center has elevators. And you are in charge of looking at identifying all of those things within the data center before they uh, use it. And uh, you meant that the elevator must have a sign that says two people only. Three people go, went in. The elevator cannot take it. Something bad happens. Guess who's getting sued? The company that paid you to identify that problem so that it doesn't happen. Guess how it affects you? Bad business. All right. I swear. I sound like a pessimist. I promise you that's not me. I sound, I sound like I'm looking at the bad side of everything. And they tend to say like us risk professionals tend to look at just the negativity, which I don't like. I'm always on the value side. But anyway, these are all these things, right? How do we identify risk in itself? Do we just say, oh, this is the risk? No. Now this slide is basically consolidating everything we spoke about. We identify the assets, everybody knows that. Identify the different threats. We identify existing control. Why are we identifying existing controls? Because the risk might not be there if we already have controls in place. So it is one thing to say, guess what? Uh, yeah, this network has so many, uh, if we connect to this public network, the chances of having malware is a lot on our devices. It is another to say, yeah, this is a very unsecured network, but you know what? Let's just connect to it and then use VPN. VPN is the control. It is also another thing to say, huh, we can do it. We can put, we can use our VPNs, but our VPNs do not provide enough protection to protect us at the capacity that we want. That's why you have to identify current existing controls and then look into the gap, right? Identify the vulnerabilities, all of these things. We talk about it, identify the consequences. What is consequences? We touch on likelihood. So if I'm to step out right now and walk without really looking side by side before crossing the road, what are the chances of me getting hit by the bus? Wait, why do I keep saying that and associating it to me? Anyway, what are the chances of um, me getting hit by the bus? Um, a lot, you know why? Because I am trying to cross I-95. What the heck? And I'm not gonna look side by side. I'm not even gonna risk it, right? Um, that's a consequence. But what are the chances of it happening? I mean, it's just my neighborhood. Like nobody even goes there. There would never be a 16 wheeler going through my neighborhood. Eh, nothing, okay, I'm willing to risk it because I am silly. Anyway. You have to identify the consequences. Now we start looking into that risk estimation process. What does that mean? This is the part where you are estimating the risk. You look at it from the consequences, the vulnerability to whatsoever, all of those things, put them in the bucket and down the side like, okay, if all of these things is to go this way, in a negative perspective, how does it affect us? Begin, because it hasn't happened, it's always a scenario based. We will talk about the different scenarios from tabletop exercises to real life scenarios, kind of like a fire drill. How, I mean, people from the military definitely know this more than I do. Due to time, I'm not going to open the ground for someone to share, but maybe in the next class. You know, how you just have your fire drills and then a scenario kind of exercise, but then it mimics a real life scenario if it were to happen. Could be that. We also have it in cybersecurity, right? Or it could just be a tabletop where the parties involved are just sitting on the table and saying like, hey, so this happened, what should be next? This is going to be next. Um, sometimes when we, uh, if it were in person, sometimes we just do a quick little tabletop, always a fun exercise, but yeah, it is. Okay, you put all of these things, they are what? Information, what does that mean? If they are information, it means we have to do certain things as part of the risk identification process. What are those things? One, we have to gather information. How do we gather information? We gather it from either a historical context, we gather it from what? From a historical context involved, what has happened, right? 
the systematic approach, more like those consultants in their fancy suit coming in and telling us like, hey, this is the way because they are the experts. I promise you, if you are a consultant, I am not, don't tag me as I am a consultant hater. No, I used to be one. I'm looking at you, Fortune. But anyway, um, moving in. Examine a business, blah, blah, blah. All of those fancy things with their good branding to tell us like, this is their expert opinion. Guess what? They sometimes are accurate, truthfully, because a lot of experience, uh, they have done a lot. And you have places like God now that will spend a lot of time doing the research to give you those things, right? And uh, no matter how you feel about Gartner rankings and uh, foreign star rankings and whatsoever, but they sometimes help organizations in identifying which provider, cloud computing, I don't know, any technology whatsoever is the best. So you avoid certain things. All right, interviews, the theoretical analysis, including a lot of things like penetration testing and whatsoever. Now we have gathered the information. How do we begin to say, okay, based on all of this information that we have gathered, we are going to classify it and say, we have identified the asset threats, vulnerabilities, consequences, all of those things. We have a lot of information that backs all our theory and whatsoever, but then how do we decide like, huh, this is a big deal, this is not. That is why we have a lot of guides for risk classification. That is why we have documents like 800-30 that says the risk is low, risk is moderate, risk is high, because obviously we just don't want to do it uphead, right? Just randomly. We want to back it up based on certain knowledge, depending on what you align with. If you are with COVID, COSO, or maybe your industry requires. By the way, Second part of the class, this will come become more clear as we begin to do that ATO process where you need to categorize a system or something like that and decide based on, oh, based on these type of information that we will be putting on this computer or this system or this cloud or this whatsoever, we are going to say based on that, this computer should be classified as moderate. That's all part of classification. Our ability to say that the risk is low, risk is high, risk is moderate, risk is whatsoever, is also, also defines our risk, either risk response, that is whether we are willing to accept it, treat it, mitigate it, all of those kind of things, right? And uh, let's take technology out of the picture. Let's look at it from that perspective of us, human beings, right? Uh, bad example, but I'm still gonna move forward. Bad neighborhoods, for example. You want to buy a house, uh, close on a mortgage, or I mean, if you're in Nova buying in Arlington, you do all cash, but anyway. <laughs> um, you want to do one of those, right? Buy a property. Uh, you look at all of those information from, hmm, to you, things like good school matters, uh, very close to Costco matters, very good, close to you know, Buffalo our wings matters because who doesn't want some wings and juices? Um, also good hospital matters, all of those things. As such, you have collected all of your information. You do a little Google search, you ask people on Reddit, your friends, your whatsoever, what do you think, blah, blah, blah. You gather all of this information and you make your decision like, okay, no, I mean, it's just like they don't have good ice cream places. They only have froyo, but I mean, it's not a big deal. So the impact is minimal. I'm willing to go with that. Nah, they don't have buffalo wings and I don't know what I'm going to eat when I'm watching football. Absolutely not going there. You know what? Let's move to Georgia because seriously, Nova sucks. You got to go 50 miles before you get one, one um, wild wings or whatever it is, whatever they call themselves. Anyway. Um, so all of those kind of things, it's you classifying like you're willing to take it. Again, I mentioned bad neighborhood. You collect a lot of information and decide whether you're willing to accept the risk or not. Some are like, no, absolutely not. Some are like, eh, I don't care. There are people that will say, if I cannot leave my front door open and go and sleep in peace, I'm definitely not moving into the neighborhood. And there are some that will say like, listen, I don't care. Whatever is going on, I'm all good. I'm just gonna move in. That's all you classifying the risk. 
Now, obviously we can do that from an organizational or industry perspective to just say, similar to how we are doing it from a personal angle and just define it. As such, we have all of these nice frameworks, nice guides and whatsoever that help us classify the, the risk based on all those collected information. We're gonna get our hands dirty when we go to that ATO kind of side of things. So what I'm going to do is quite unfortunate, I need to do a little bit better with managing this time, seeing we're doing it over Zoom. Um, as such, I'm going to stop here. 